The nominees for documentary short subjects are Cradle of Genius, Jim O'Connor and Tom Hayes Carl Dido Film Luamo Igrigio, Man in Grey, Benedetto Benedetti Project Hope, Frank P. Bivas And uh, the winner, Mr. Chikari? The winner is Project Hope, Frank P. Bibas. <laughs> Members of the Academy, I'm overwhelmed and I'm very grateful and I appreciate this honor. Thank you very much. of Asia, half a world that knew culture and beauty a thousand years before Columbus. And this is another face of Asia, reflecting the people's major problems, poverty and disease. Outside the pitifully few hospitals and clinics, numberless patients wait. Patients like this orphan, a boy who was to receive the priceless gift of a new life. These are two of the doctors who played key roles in giving him that new life. Thanks to Project Hope. Project Hope is people. People working together for a better tomorrow. I'm Bob Considine. I've spent most of my life reporting the joys and the sorrows and the strivings and ideals of mankind. What you're about to see is part of the great American tradition, the tradition of helping those about us to help themselves. I think it'll make you proud. Not long ago, I was covering a tenth session of the United Nations. Fidel Castro had hurled accusations angrily denouncing the United States as ruthless. Nikita Khrushchev had introduced the shoe into diplomacy. And all this at a time when the world so desperately needed accord for the welfare of man. Right in the middle of this, I was told there was an overseas call for me in our UN office. Okay. The voice of amateur radio was bringing in the hospital ship SS Hope, a floating medical center supported by the American people, en route to Southeast Asia. California. This is the hospital ship SS Hope, Maritime Mobile W8OLJ in the Java Sea. On board were a group of dedicated Americans doctors, nurses, and medical technicians who were prepared to share their health knowledge with the people of Asia. All had volunteered to spend at least a year away from home and family on their unprecedented mission of mercy. Months earlier, a former United States Navy ship was taken out of mothballs, refitted and rechristened the SS Hope. Her last duty had been during the Korean War. Now she would be loaned to Project Hope, a non-government private organization financed by American industry and by gifts from private citizens throughout the country. Keynote speaker at the dedication of the ship was Dr. William B. Walsh, president of the foundation which had raised the three and a half million dollars needed to finance the project for the first year. The sailing date in September of 1960 marked the culmination of months of preparation and hard work by the Project Hope volunteers. Ahead lay Southeast Asia. There, these American doctors, nurses, and medical technicians would begin their mission at their first port of call, the Island Republic of Indonesia. They came from every quarter of the United States. Among them were nurses from New England and the West Coast, and doctors from North and South who had given up their practices at home to lend a hand to their brothers in medicine in newly developing countries on the opposite side of the world. At the invitation of the Medical Society of Indonesia, the SS Hope was crossing the Pacific toward islands bearing such romantic names as Sumatra, Borneo, Java, Bali. What kind of country would they find? What sort of people? With what kind of health problems?
My country, the Republic of Indonesia, is made up of more than 3,000 islands that are beautiful and fertile. But most of our people are very poor. We still grow rice as our ancestors did, and it requires many hands. And of course, the more hands, the more mouths there are to feed. Freedom is new to us, and freedom is very dear. Today we are building a new nation, and we are building it with pride. To do this, we must educate the young, and all of us must learn new ways of doing things. There is no doubt we have accomplished much since we achieved freedom, but there is much yet to be done. For a long while, our people will continue to carry heavy burdens and work with primitive tools and machines. But each brick we lay is not only part of a new home or factory. It is a stepping stone for our new nation. These growing years are difficult, but they are much like the early years in America after her revolution. And like the pioneers of America, we are eager to work and build in freedom. We know there are many obstacles in our way, we have few books from which to learn or teach. We have an ancient culture and many customs which are hard to change. Many of our people still believe that disease is caused by evil spirits and this creates many problems for our doctors and teachers. For example, while marketplaces are very colorful, they have changed little in hundreds of years. Sanitation is ignored because most of our people don't understand that sickness can be carried by dirty food or water. As a result, the life expectancy of our people is only 32 years. The hand of death is always among us. Even in our capital, Jakarta, much of the sanitation is very bad. For generations, we have used the canals which flow through the city for all our needs, for drinking, washing, bathing, swimming, and even the disposal of waste. Out in the country, the rivers and streams are pure at their source, but when they have flowed past even one village, they become polluted. Because of this, disease is everywhere. The statistics of our medical society report there is one doctor for every 100,000 people. But in some places, there's only one doctor for half a million people. Diseases which could be cured easily in early stages go untreated until it's too late. Because we have so few doctors and nurses, our traditional dukun is found everywhere. The Dukun is a man or a woman whose primitive knowledge has been passed down through the centuries. He is what you might call a medicine man, and most of my people take their problems to him. To them, he is a doctor, fortune teller, spirit healer, all in one. For every real doctor, we have hundreds of Dukuns practicing their ancient calling. We are aware of our many problems and are trying to overcome them. We are eager to cooperate with friendly people who wish to help us build a strong foundation for our new country. It took us nearly a month to cross the Pacific, and it's a good thing it did. When we left San Francisco, I don't think many of us knew how much work there'd be before we'd have the medical department squared away. Take the library. People everywhere in the States are donating thousands of medical books. These have to be cataloged for our reference, and duplicate copies set aside for the Indonesian medical schools, which need them badly. It's hard to describe the spirit on board, all the nurses worked for a fraction of what they made back home, and they signed on for many different reasons. Literally, they worked day and night, cleaning the wards and putting the operating rooms in order. One of the nurses was the daughter of a missionary. She had been brought up in Asia, and knew firsthand how much the people needed medical help. 
But whatever her background, every nurse on board was determined Project Hope would be a success. As for the doctors, well, a lot of us saw duty in World War II. More than half of us in the Pacific. We saw a lot and learned a lot in those years. And we discovered there was a whole field of medicine that American doctors knew little about. As we have said, malaria is the most important disease of the tropical variety, both from a standpoint of morbidity and mortality. To come now to details, we have on the screen here a slide of human blood showing the malarial organisms within them. May I have the next slide, please? With the great increase in travel to all parts of the world, it's important that we in America are prepared to cope with any threat to our public health. Thanks to hope, we'd have a chance to further our knowledge. Before we took off, Project Hope's architects tried to make the ship self-sufficient in every way. The system for making milk and drinking water is one of the most amazing processes I've ever seen. Imagine making milk from seawater. Every day, thousands of gallons of salt water from the Pacific Ocean are pumped into the ship. Then the big tanks boil the water and the salt is taken out. After filtering the water over and over, pure milk solids are added. Then butter fat is blended. The result? Milk that tastes just like something straight from a dairy at home. The iron cow, and that's what we all call this operation, can produce thousands of gallons of milk a day. Where we're going, milk is scarce. We'll be needing a ready source to help build up the strength of our patients, although most of it will be distributed to people in the villages on shore. In this case, the containers were labeled in both Indonesian and English, so everyone will know what he's drinking and that it comes from the SS Hope. We also have the problem of how to get along in a country where only a few people understand English. Every day on the way over, we had language classes taught by two Indonesian girls on their way home from school in the States. Silahkan, please. Silahkan, please. Hello, goodbye, and thank you. It's a four-week cram course designed to help us do our jobs better. On a rainy morning in October, we arrived at our first port of call, Jakarta, Indonesia's capital. Now, all of us on board would have a chance to test our skills and dreams against the realities of a foreign land and people. Our first visitors were ambassadors from the many different countries represented in Indonesia. Even the ambassador from the Soviet Union toured the ship. Indonesian political leaders, doctors, and their wives came aboard to inspect us, too. They could see that the SS Hope was a floating medical center, ready for business, and not a hollow propaganda boast. The very day the ship docked, our first group of rotating medical specialists arrived in Jakarta by air. They left family and income to share their skills and knowledge with the people of these newly developing countries, teaching while healing. For me, and for every doctor and nurse on board, there'll be an Indonesian counterpart who's been trained in the same branch of medicine. Indonesians who will leave their homes and their jobs to work side by side with Americans. I was assigned to work with Dr. Noor, a young internist who led his class at the Central Indonesian Medical University. I was honored to be among two selected by the Indonesian Project Hope Committee to serve on the ship. English is the official second language of Indonesia. I know English, but many of my countrymen do not. The signs throughout the ship in English and Indonesian will be most helpful, especially to the many patients who will come here. Our nurses 
as well as our doctors come to the Hope ship for study and training. The day after I arrived, ambulances brought the first of thousands of patients who would be treated aboard the SS Hope. Some of them are young and helpless. Some are frightened and must be persuaded to come aboard. Others are old and for them dead seem near. Working side by side with the Americans, we Indonesians admit the patients. In the beginning, we do not know this child's name, nor his village, nor his family. He is only a number on our records. For many of our patients, the ship seems a gift from God. Some come from the crowded cities, some from distant jungle villages. All are gravely ill, afraid they will never see their homes or families again. The ship and the Americans seem very strange at first. Pain and fear are companions for all the sick people we take on board. Soon after the first patients are admitted, we have a most distinguished visitor, the leader of our country, President Sukarno. He is specially interested in the main lecture room where through closed circuit television, doctors and students learn how various operations are performed. The little sick children in the pediatric ward get most of his attention, however. Before the hope ship came, our doctors believed that all of them would soon die. Now perhaps there is some chance for them. Our doctors and nurses work with the Americans diagnosing, prescribing and treating. The lectures help every day concern the whole world of medicine. We Indonesians know we have much to learn from the Americans. We know also there is much we can teach them too. It is our task to inform the American doctors on tropical diseases, the work of our dukons and midwives, our polyclinics and our public health programs. The American doctors lectures on pediatric and infant diet, surgery and anesthetics, radiology and bacteriology, and many more subjects. As time goes on, other specialists will join the ship to help Project Hope bring the latest medical information and techniques to other countries. The operating rooms are in constant use, morning to night. On a typical day, we have a cystolithiasis in operating room 1 at 8.30 and a Swanson operation in room 2 at the same time. At 10 o'clock, there's a splenectomy in room 1 and the excision of a renal cyst in room 2. Operation follows operation but they represent far more than just the treatment of the sick. Every doctor knows that when a surgeon has seen a special operation done once or twice, he learns how to do it himself, and that's what counts. These Indonesian surgeons will be able to go on from here now, do the operations themselves, and most important, be able to teach others too. Eventually, we found out that our little orphan's name was Sana. The surgery on his tumor lasted more than six and a half hours. Our television cameras piped the delicate operation into the lecture room on closed-circuit TV for the students and observers, teaching, so that the knowledge of one man, one doctor, one surgeon, one nurse, can become the knowledge of thousands. This is the basic purpose of Project HOPE. After the operation, little Sana was puzzled about the missing growth on his neck. But he managed to eat well. And there were always playmates wanting to visit him. The surgeon and intensive care nurse watched over him closely. The result? Well, for the first time in his young life, little Sana, unknown, unwanted when he came aboard, can hold his head erect. Whenever the schedule fits, monsoon, rain or not, the Indonesians put together a show we'd never have seen at home. This 
is a people to people program and everything can't be all work in medicine. But even when we take a few hours off, the shipboard routine goes on. The iron cow keeps turning out plenty of pure milk and water. Every day it's put ashore for distribution by our roving medical teams. These teams operate inland, far away from the ship. Free milk turned out to be the high point of every maternal child care program we scheduled. Indonesia is a country where the infant mortality rate is just about the highest in the world. We held classes for midwives and dukans, a vital part of our onshore work. Something as simple as teaching them the proper way to wash their hands in clean water before delivering a baby will save countless lives. With so many medical groups operating on shore, communications could be a major problem. But radio-equipped jeeps give us the ship-to-shore link we need. It didn't happen every day, but we did have emergencies. And then the radio hookup between the ship and our shore parties really came in handy. In one case, an infant's life was saved because of our communication system. In answer to an urgent call, we were able to put an incubator to quick, practical use. When you consider how many lives are being saved aboard the ship, the delivery of an incubator just in time to save one life doesn't stand out as a great accomplishment. Still, it's an example of Hope's work that one family and one village and one entire community in Indonesia will never forget. And I won't either. Because they have so few doctors and hospitals, the Indonesian medical people work chiefly on a clinic basis. On the island of Bali, for example, one perion, or district, is tended by one male nurse and a midwife. Two medical people serving more than 5,000. When the SS Hope arrived at Bali, our specialists toured the clinics. They prescribed modern drugs for the simpler cases, and determined which patients they'd send either to the island central hospital or back to the ship for treatment. This onshore work is one of the most important steps in the HOPE teaching program. Wherever we went, there was always an Indonesian doctor with us. I don't know who learned more from this swapping of medical information. The young men like Dr. Noor or the medical staff from America. We spend about three weeks in each of the ports we visit. This gives time for most of our patients to recuperate so that when we move on to the next port or harbor, they're ready to go home or to the local hospital for convalescence. When it was time for him to leave, Sana could not help but realize that he had gained the affection of the medical staff and ship's crew. Thanks to the skill of Dr. Radcliffe, and thanks to Project Hope, which brought medical equipment and staff 8,000 miles across the Pacific. Sana is going ashore here to his home in Jakarta. Sana, this is for you to take with you. And to us, you will always be a symbol of what Project Hope can achieve. Goodbye and good luck. Yo-Yo, the little girl in a crib next to Sana, would also be missed. Her parents had been told that her only chance to live would be with the help of Project Hope. We were able to save her, and I'll never forget her parents' joy when their little girl was returned to them, cured. Those of us aboard this ship are privileged to see the dream of Project Hope come true. As many of our patients leave the ship with new sight, new hearing, new speech. Others, in a real sense, have been given a new way of life. For some, like Sana, treatment will continue in hospitals in their homeland. 
In the hearts of the patients, there obviously is a gratitude beyond expression. As for us, we're proud of what we've been able to do. But at the same time, we're grateful for what we are learning from the people of these countries we visit. About their problems and their aspirations. Not only for the patients is it time to go home. For some of us doctors and nurses, it is also a time for parting. We go back to our regular lives, carrying our new knowledge with us. Now, more Indonesians and later other men and women of medicine throughout the world will take our places, people working with people. For centuries, the sea has brought many things to Indonesia, merchants and conquerors, raging storms and cruel wars. But never before has the sea brought us such a gift as the ship home. For as one of our leading Indonesian writers has said, the East forgets many things, but never forgets or loses its respect for a teacher. I, for one, will never forget my American friends. In men like Dr. Noor is convincing proof of hope's success in Indonesia. In the future, men such as he will be better able to train others and to care for their own sick. For patients like the pathetic orphan Sana, the Indonesians themselves have the will to fight disease, to grow and to prosper. In remote areas today, fathers work to build a new polyclinic, assisted by even the youngest children of the village. Their methods and tools are primitive, but their determination to make a better life for themselves is strong. Project Hope has helped to encourage them to face the future with greater confidence. More important, they have been left a legacy of learning from the heart of the American people a wealth of knowledge which may be passed on from man to man, from skilled hand to skilled hand, and mind to mind in the years to come. I have my many other ports, many needful lands where Project Hope will teach the art of medicine. Here with me now is Dr. William B. Walsh, who is the president and founder of Project Hope. Dr. Walsh, what can we all do to continue this wonderful work? Mr. Considine, hope can go only as far as the American people want it to. Uh, it is, after all, a non-profit, non-government effort and depends completely for its support upon public assistance. We have the volunteers, physicians, nurses, technicians. We have the invitations from other countries more than we can possibly fulfill. All we need is the continuing financial assistance of the American people that believe as we do. And I think our whole effort can be best described in the words of President Kennedy in his recent inaugural address. To those people in the huts and villages of half the globe struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right.